June 26th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, 1 Chronicles chapters 19 through 21 of the Old Testament. Later King Nahash of the Ammonites died, and his son succeeded him. David said, I will express my loyalty to Hunan, son of Nahash, for his father was loyal to me. So David sent messengers to express his sympathy over his father's death. When David's servants entered Ammonite territory to visit Hunan and express the king's sympathy, the Ammonite officials said to Hunan, Do you really think David is trying to honor your father by sending these messengers to express his sympathy? No, his servants have come to you so that they can get information and spy out the land. So Hunan seized David's servants and shaved their beards off. He cut off the lower part of the robe so that their buttocks were exposed and then sent them away. Messengers came and told David what had happened to the men. So he summoned them for the men were thoroughly humiliated. The king said, stay in Jericho until your beards grow again, then you may come back. When the Ammonites realized that David was disgusted with them, Hunan and the Ammonites sent 1,000 talents of silver to hire chariots and charioteers from Aram Neheraim, Aram, Maacah, and Zobah. They hired 32,000 chariots along with the king of Maacah and his army, who came and camped in front of Medaba. The Ammonites also assembled from their cities and marched out to do battle. When David heard the news, he sent Joab and the entire army to meet them. The Ammonites marched out and were deployed for battle at the entrance to the city, while the kings who had come were by themselves in the field. When Joab saw that the battle would be fought on two fronts, he chose some of Israel's best men and deployed them against the Arameans. He put his brother Abishai in charge of the rest of the army, and they were deployed against the Ammonites. Joab said, If the Arameans start to overpower me, you come to my rescue. If the Ammonites start to overpower you, I will come to your rescue. Be strong, let's fight bravely for the sake of our people and the cities of our God. The Lord will do what he decides is best. So Joab and his men marched toward the Arameans to do battle, and they fled before him. When the Ammonites saw the Arameans flee, they fled before Joab's brother Abishai and withdrew into the city. Joab went back to Jerusalem. When the Arameans realized that they had been defeated by Israel, they sent for reinforcements from beyond the Euphrates River, led by Shophak, the commanding general of Hadad-Ezer's army. When David was informed, he gathered all Israel, crossed the Jordan River, and marched against them. David deployed his army against the Arameans for battle, and they fought against him. The Arameans fled before Israel. David killed 7,000 Aramean charioteers and 40,000 infantrymen. He also killed Shophak, the commanding general. When Hadad Ezer's subjects saw they were defeated by Israel, they made peace with David and became his subjects. The Arameans were no longer willing to help the Ammonites. In the spring, at the time when kings normally conduct wars, Joab led the army into battle and devastated the land of the Ammonites. He went and besieged Rabbah, while David stayed in Jerusalem. Joab defeated Rabbah and tore it down. David took the crown from the head of their king and wore it. Its weight was a talent of gold, and it was set with precious stones. He took the large amount of plunder from the city. He removed the city's residents and made them do hard labor with saws, iron picks, and axes. This was his policy with all the Ammonite cities. Then David and all the army returned to Jerusalem. Later there was a battle with the Philistines in Gezer. At that time, Sibachai, the Hushathite, killed Sippai, one of the descendants of the Rephaim, and the Philistines were subdued. There was another battle with the Philistines in which Elhanan, son of Jair, the Bethlehemite, killed the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, whose spear had a shaft as big as the crossbeam of a weaver's loom. 
In a battle in Gath, there was a large man who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, twenty-four in all. He too was a descendant of Repha. When he taunted Israel, Jonathan, son of Shimea, David's brother, killed him. These were the descendants of Repha who lived in Gath. They were killed by the hand of David and his soldiers. An adversary opposed Israel, inciting David to count how many warriors Israel had. David told Joab and the leaders of the army, Go, count the number of warriors from Beersheba to Dan. Then bring back a report to me so I may know how many we have. Joab replied, May the Lord make his army a hundred times larger. My master, O king, do not all of them serve my master? Why does my master want to do this? Why bring judgment on Israel? But the king's edict stood despite Joab's objections. So Joab left and traveled throughout Israel before returning to Jerusalem. Joab reported to David the number of warriors. In all Israel, there were 1,100,000 sword-wielding soldiers. Judah alone had 470,000 sword-wielding soldiers. Now Joab did not number Levi and Benjamin, for the king's edict disgusted him. God was also offended by it, so he attacked Israel. David said to God, I have sinned greatly by doing this. Now please remove the guilt of your servant, for I have acted very foolishly. The Lord told Gad, David's prophet, Go, tell David, this is what the Lord says. I am offering you three forms of judgment from which to choose. Pick one of them. Gad went to David and told him, This is what the Lord says. Pick one of these. Three years of famine, or three months being chased by your enemies and struck down by their swords, or three days being struck down by the Lord, during which a plague will invade the land, and the Lord's messenger will destroy throughout Israel's territory. Now decide what I should tell the one who sent me. David said to Gad, I am very upset. I prefer to be attacked by the Lord, for his mercy is very great. I do not want to be attacked by men. So the Lord sent a plague through Israel, and 70,000 Israelite men died. God sent an angel to ravage Jerusalem. As he was doing so, the Lord watched and relented from his judgment. He told the angel who was destroying, That's enough. Stop now. Now the Lord's angel was standing near the threshing floor of Ornon, the Jebusite. David looked up and saw the Lord's messenger standing between the earth and sky, with his sword drawn and in his hand, stretched out over Jerusalem. David and the leaders, covered with sackcloth, threw themselves down with their faces to the ground. David said to God, Was I not the one who decided to number the army? I am the one who sinned and committed this awful deed. As for these sheep, what have they done? O Lord my God, attack me and my family, but remove the plague from your people. So the Lord's messenger told Gad to instruct David to go up and build an altar for the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornon, the Jebusite. So David went up as Gad instructed him to do in the name of the Lord. While Ornon was threshing wheat, he turned and saw the messenger, and he and his four sons hid themselves. When David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David. He came out from the threshing floor and bowed to David with his face to the ground. David said to Ornan, Sell me the threshing floor so I can build on it an altar for the Lord. I'll pay top price so that the plague may be removed from the people. Ornan told David, You can have it. My master, the king, may do what he wants. Look, I am giving you the oxen for burnt sacrifices, the threshing sledges for wood and the wheat for an offering. I give it all to you. King David replied to Ornan, No, I insist on buying it for top price. I will not offer to the Lord what belongs to you or offer a burnt sacrifice that costs me nothing. So David bought the place from Ornan for 600 pieces of gold. David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt sacrifices and peace offerings. He called out to the Lord and the Lord responded by sending fire from the sky and consuming the burnt sacrifice on the altar. 
the Lord ordered the messenger to put his sword back into its sheath. At that time, when David saw that the Lord responded to him at the threshing floor of Ornon, the Jebusite, he sacrificed there. Now the Lord's tabernacle, which Moses had made in the wilderness, and the altar for burnt sacrifices were at that time at the worship center in Gibeon. But David could not go before it to seek God's will, for he was afraid of the sword of the Lord's messenger. God, as soon as I, I read an adversary opposed Israel inciting David, I'm like, oh, shoot, we're in trouble. <laughs> that whole male ego reared up and because of it, sin occurred. And it's not it's not just in men. Women have their egos just as well. And I think any time, well, I know that any time we put anything before you, things aren't going to go well at all. Uh, most of all our ego when we want to be right about something I, I just saw somebody the other day so angry and so upset over making a point and ultimately the point wasn't anything it was something very small not only in like in the scheme of things of totality of how big God is but just in like day-to-day -day things it wasn't a relatively small thing and they had made such a big deal out of it. Whereas they could have uh, instead turned that around and taken time to show that person your mercy, your grace, your love. And that was an example that popped into my mind. But I've done that a trillion times where, where my anger, because I'm offended that somebody did something to me, that my anger is taken over and I'm rude to the person. I'm not gentle. I'm not loving. <laughs> I'm not kind. Oh, I've done that so many times. God, I, I just come before you and ask that you help us keep that anger, that ego, things that agitate us, offenses that probably weren't even intentional for the most part in the first place. But we just watch that ego and acknowledge the second that it gets out of control. There were opportunities for David to turn back. Joab's like, um, do you really want to do this? Because I'm thinking it's not a good idea. And Joab even, even took upon himself the probability of death by not numbering uh, Levi and Benjamin, the tribes of Levi and Benjamin, against the king's wishes. That was crazy. But he knew that you would be upset with him. So when our ego gets out of check, help us remember the second it goes out of check, what in the world are we doing? We need to stop and figure out why it is that we're offended, why our sense of righteousness and justice about ourselves is being called into play. I, I do know there's such a thing as righteous anger, but 99% of the time, our anger is not righteous in the slightest. And then figure out how you would want us to deal with those situations, how we can do it out of love, out of grace, out of mercy, uh, so that not only in that situation do I feel okay about the situation, the other person feels okay, but more importantly that you're glorified in that situation. How, how horrid must it be for you to watch Christians act out from their ego in situations and anger and frustration and jealousy and have other people watching your chosen people act this way. God, I am just so sorry for all the times that I did that. And unfortunately, I know that there'll be more in the future. But I know with your help and your guidance, together we can work on that. And it can be a thing where as my ego goes unchecked, that it becomes checked really quick. And those incredible Bible verses that you have taught us about loving others and showing them grace and showing them mercy hopefully those oh god i just pray that they just come flooding into my heart and that offense again probably against something that wasn't even intentional in the first place that off, that offense um is just blown away like dandelion fluff uh, and replaced instead with what it is and how it is that you want me to respond to somebody thank you god in your son's name i pray amen